Patrick is an international venture capitalist. He is the author of Fear of Missing Out, Practical Decision-Making in a World of Overwhelming Choice. Patrick coined the term FOMO, Fear of Missing Out, as well as the related term FOBO, Fear of Better Option, in a 2004 article in the student newspaper of Harvard Business School. FOMO since has been added to the dictionary, and FOBO has become an increasingly popular framework to describe choice paralysis. I'm sure a lot of you folks have used one or both of these terms in your everyday lives. Patrick is the host of the hit podcast called FOMO Sapiens. And Patrick is also the author of an international bestseller, The 10% Entrepreneur, Live Your Startup Dream Without Quitting Your Day Job. Patrick has been featured in the New York Times, Politico, The Financial Times, The Guardian, and Inc. Uh, Patrick is originally from Maine, and he has visited more than 100 countries and is now based in New York. Uh, Patrick, it is exciting to welcome you here. Great to see you. Uh, welcome to this conversation. Thank you, Boris. And it's good to be in Canada because I can't go right now. So virtually in one of my favorite cities, Toronto, is uh, and the 416 is great. Absolutely. Looking forward to welcoming you here after the pandemic is over. And uh, I guess not necessarily adding to the country count, but uh, adding to the repeat, repeat visit counter if you have one. How many countries is that by now, Patrick? So by the way, Canada is my ancestral land because my grandparents are Quebecois. So uh, that's, that's where I get my height from, um, all five foot seven inches of me. But wow. uh, I, I've been to 103 countries. The last one that I went to before the pandemic was Kazakhstan. Mm. And then, oh no, Guatemala. And then, you know, everything stopped. So I, I, I sort of feel like now that I hit 100, the, I had this kind of desire to hit 100, and then now I'm sort of very happy to be in one place. That's, that's absolutely fair. What about Turkey, we're being asked? Have you been to Turkey? I have been to Turkey. Actually, I've been to Turkey 30 times. So <laughs> I was on the board of a company there, and I, I love Turkey, and I speak a little bit of Turkish, um, which I will not display for you today. That's fair. That's fair, but very interesting. And then you mentioned your investing, and of course... You, you were working very actively before Harvard Business School. You were an international investor thereafter. Tell us a little bit about your time at the school and how you came up with FOMO. Sure. So first of all, HBS was not something that I ever thought I would do. I just, I didn't really know anybody who went to Harvard Business School, even though I lived, I worked at um, JP Morgan. Well, I worked at Chase before the merger. It became J.P. Morgan when I was there. And there was one guy called Jeff Wall, who um, some of you may have heard of. He started a company called Work Market that was sold recently to ADP. He has a book out this year. So he, he got into HBS, and I didn't know him particularly well, but he was like the smartest guy in our, in our sort of cohort a year ahead of me. And I remember just thinking, like, who goes to HBS? And then um, it was just not something that was on my radar. And then I took the GMAT, and I did well in the GMAT, so I applied. And uh, I, I took the GMAT the day before September 11th, 2001. So actually, I remember doing well on the GMAT. I studied like I'd never studied before. And then going to um, a dinner in Soho and looking down at the Twin Towers and commenting to my friend how beautiful they were. And then I woke up the next morning. And of course, we'd been attacked and they were gone. And um, I got into HBS. And when I went, like many people who entered the school in 2002, we had been through the 9-11 attacks, and then we had also lived through the implosion of the first tech boom, where the NASDAQ fell from 5,000 to 1,300. And I was a VC at the time, and all my companies got super affected, and I had to fire all these people, and it was terrible. And so HBS represented this major um, sort of escape from reality, this bubble of fun and opportunities and you know, smart people and living in this beautiful place. And I had never lived in such a choice rich environment. I come from this small town in Maine. And so I decided that I had to do everything because I had realized how fragile life was. And so I tried to do everything, every class, every lecture, every trip, every club. Um, I joined, I joined all the, I joined every club. Even you didn't though, do a lot of sleep, eh? No. And so as a result, I woke up one day and I remember sort of like, people complaining that they were having their birthday party and that people were going to five other events first. And I thought, well, this is, you know, how stressed we all were about this. And so I realized like, 
we were feeling anxiety about trying to do it all. I started calling that fear of missing out, shortened it to FOMO, and wrote an article in The Harvest uh, right as I was graduating about this funny phenomenon at HBS where you know, you're spoiled for choice and how it's overwhelming and how it's a very deep part of the culture and how we would soon be going back to normal life where people didn't have those problems. And so that's how the article happened way back in May of 2004. A while back. And then, so what, what happened after? How did it become such a global phenomenon? So I've done a little bit of a forensic dig on this. It's, yeah. it's hard to know exactly every element of this, but basically what happened was uh, that article came out in 2004 and it became very popular amongst my, cl my class and then the class of 05. And it became sort of a, a word that people started to use and it stayed very popular within the HPS environment. And in fact, in 2007, Business Week wrote an article about this new affliction at Harvard Business School and other MBA programs called FOMO. And so we saw, you can trace that, and there was a book in 2007 called Ahead of the Curve by Philip Delvis Broughton, which I, they've renamed like what they don't teach you at HBS or something, or what they teach you at HBS, or it's got some name like that. And he talks about FOMO as a big part of HBS culture in that book. And so you see that it lived on there. And then I think what happened is, you know, all of our friends who, you know, go on to banking and consulting and all these other places globally, they took the word with them and they started using it because it's the kind of word, it's something people can identify with. And at the same time, social media, which didn't exist when I was a student, in fact, Mark Zuckerberg and I were, while I was inventing FOMO, he was inventing Facebook. I mean, who did better? I, it's, it's a good question. We, we, we um, shall see, right? To be determined. We shall see. I still have time. Um, at least I haven't like spread disinformation across the globe. So I have that going for me. But, um, but uh, he, you know, social media became this sort of agent of an accelerator of FOMO and an equalizer of FOMO to all people. Because at the end of the day, FOMO is about a perception that there's something better out there than we can, what you could be doing at the moment. And so anybody now with social media can, can feel those feelings. Interesting. And, and, and how did that, and, and like you said, very, very timely for sure. And how did that advance to FOMO, which you, you say and you share in your book, Fear of Missing Out? that uh, it, is, it is one of the more dangerous foes that the person can have. Yeah, so FOMO, if we think about the way I've just defined it, listen, it's pernicious, but the reality is that as you gain life experience and you sort of have a sense of the reality of what you live in and you can sort of better parse the incoming data, you can say, well, I have a perception something's better out there, but you know, I see my friend who's working in investment banking who just bought the big house, but I don't want to do that. That's that's not me. You know, it's not the that's not the career where I'm going to be a star, or I'm not sort of interested in the trade offs that need to be made. So I don't feel the FOMO as much. FOBO, fear of a better option, is the anxiety that we feel when we are facing a decision and we have perfectly acceptable options and we're afraid of choosing one because we may not be choosing the very best thing. And so therefore, we keep our options open. And the reason why that is so difficult for folks like um, the people who, who are here with us in, this, in this Zoom today, is that as you proceed in life, uh, if you have success, if you have options, uh, that only becomes more, uh, you have more and more options. And in fact, you have less and less time to deal with these things. And so the more wealth and success you have, the more likely it is that you're gonna have an array of options that are very attractive and you then struggle to deal with them. And that's everything from where to go on vacation to you know, which job to take, there's all, you know, which school to choose for your kids. And so I see that my friends, uh, many of my contemporaries, uh, they are, they, they are, you know, they, they know what they don't want in terms of like, they know, oh, I'm not gonna chase after this thing that gives me FOMO, but they have trouble selecting from the many attractive things that are in front of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, hence, and hence you think it is actually more dangerous when they get hung up on FOMO than when they, they try to do too much and when they're feeling FOMO. So the way I think about it is, is, is like this. FOMO is, is, has an, has a, a positive element to it and that FOMO can wake up uh, our, we, it can awaken us to things that we may want to explore. If you're feeling FOMO about something, it may be that you should find a sensible way to determine whether or not that is something that you'd like to do. FOMO, on the other hand, when you're not making choices, you're making everybody around you wait whilst you sort of continue to go through your analysis paralysis. Number one, it's bad for you because it means you can't build things and you can't be a leader. 
Nobody says like, oh, wow, you know, Mahatma Gandhi, you know, he had tons of FOBO. No, he knew he was decisive, right? Uh, number two is that uh, it, it affects the people around you. So I think of FOMO like drinking wine. A little wine, maybe you loosen up, get on the dance floor, try something new. FOBO is like smoking. It's bad for you. It's bad for all the people around you because of its secondary effects. Okay, understood. And how, how does one become aware of having FOMO, about having FOBO, which we're, we're saying is more dangerous? How does one combat that uh, that likely ill that we, we, we will encounter in our age and especially in this very lucky, unfortunate group, like you mentioned, that will have a lot of different career, personal, entertainment, etc. choices? Yeah, so part of this, uh, this is a huge topic, obviously, and, and I, we can dig into it as, as much as... And I know you talk about it extensively in your book as well. Yeah, which is, it, the whole point of the book is really about, it's about how to be decisive. And I think, you know, one of the things that I would say is that these are, these are, um, these are uh, afflictions of affluence, right? So one thing that I think all of us felt during pandemic and lockdown is maybe the FOBO and the FOMO changed in different ways because your option set changed as well. Um, however, I think it's very important to recognize, number one, that part of, uh, part of identifying FOMO and FOBO is being somewhat self-aware. If you spend all of your time uh, compulsively searching uh, on LinkedIn and other social networks to see what other people are doing, if you feel a deep sense of stress around the fact that you want to do three things in one night, you try to do them all, you know, that, that's, that's kind of cluing into your FOMO. If you, um, if you are delaying decision-making, pushing off, spending way too much time on things that are really not important, you know, whether you should um, stay at one of three hotels that are all sort of the same on your, on your trip, uh, if people are complaining about you not um, oh, flaking on them, uh, which mm -hmm. is something we see people, you know, they, they, one thing that, that really drives me crazy and there's a clear sign of FOBO is trying to make plans with people and they won't commit. Those types of things, if you can be aware of your own behavior and how you're directing your energy, but also listen to the people in your life and what they're telling you, people tell you that they're frustrated with you in these different ways. You may not have the word FOMO or FOBO for it, but as you start listening to the data points that are coming in, you can start to identify patterns of behavior. Um, and, and it's important because, you know, I, I have a, a person in my life that I know that has serious FOBO. FOBO, everything from sort of what to eat for dinner, all the way to uh, somebody, this person dated somebody for 15 years and wasn't able to event, you know, commit towards um, sort of a marriage, uh, despite the other person's desires. I mean, and there the pattern of behaviors goes through to everything in this person's life. And, you know, it, I think he, he, he would have been served by people stepping up and helping him to work through it. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. Mm, understood. Understood. So some, someone like that, you're saying one of the ways to break that cycle is for that person to get input. Uh, what if what if the person isn't aware, is just completely oblivious, people aren't giving input? I suppose they could see the signs that you're suggesting. Uh, they could get they could get the input, assuming they now know they have they have a major case of FOBO. What do they do? Yeah, so if let's deal with FOBO first. So FOBO, um, listen, there's there's the little things in life, which probably take up as much as much time as the big ones, but really the stakes are incredibly low. And so the whole point of my TED talk, which I, which came out um, in in December, 2009. Uh, 2019, 2019, uh, was called How to Make Faster Decisions. It's about overcoming indecision on things that don't really matter. And that, the classic example is like, okay, um, should I, you know, should I go f to the gym today or should I not go to the gym today? Well, it doesn't really matter. You won't even remember sort of thinking about this in a day or two, but people can spend a lot of time on in inconsequential decisions. Like, you know, should I, I did this, I just bought, um, I just bought like plates for my new house. And it's like, you know, you're, you're on the website. It's like, there's a thousand types of, I mean, it's overwhelming. It's like, which one are you gonna buy? Uh, and so what I tend to do is with the, the things that don't really matter, like, should I have the chicken or the fish? I, I use a technique that I've been using for over 20 years called ask the watch. I take my watch, left side is the chicken, the right side is the fish. I look down and see where the second hand is. 
and the decision is made for me. Because the reality is I make most of those decisions anyway without having to think about it. But when I get stuck on a decision that has no financial implication, uh, no sort of long-term implications and that I'll forget in a couple of days, I know that that is, an, that is basically what I call a no stakes decision. And I outsource that like almost like flipping a coin. When I have a low stakes decision, like buying the, the dishes, like the low stakes decision is something like, you know, it, it, I'll remember making that decision in a month. I'm going to use these things. It is, a, you know, it's like an investment of some money, um, but I just don't feel equipped. You know, it's like, I look at, to me, they're all the same, right? I, I, I call that you, you make that decision wrong. Right. I mean, it won't make it hurt me, but at the same time, I'm still stuck. So I call that a low stakes decision. Like, some financial implication, you know, there is some importance, there are some criteria I need. I want to make a smart decision, but I'm stuck and I can't move forward. There with a low stakes decision, I outsource it. So for example, buying these new dishes, I thought of three people that I knew that I thought had decent taste and I sent them the options and then I asked them to choose for me and they did and I ordered them. And so it's really about outsourcing things that at the end of the day, you're sort of like indifferent. Um, if you really had a strong viewpoint, you would just select it. But when you're indifferent, that's where you can get stuck. With the big things, that's where you need to work. Is when you're deciding things that have long-term implications, financial implications, life implications, where you have a lot of options and you're stuck, that's where you need to go through a process of sort of due diligence. You need to sort of, I uh, have this sort of like this approach whereby you force yourself to choose a, a, a front runner because at this point you're sort of indifferent, right? But you force yourself to choose one based on just sort of gut. And then you compare that front runner to each other criteria based on, you, you, you need to have set some criteria and do some research. And then you force yourself to eliminate one and choose the better. And in doing that, you are choosing something that is better. You're forcing yourself to do it and you eliminate the other one forever. And that fixes the problem you have with FOBO, which is that you keep going back to the same set of options without eliminating any of them. And that is the pathology when we feel FOBO. And if you read the, the, the work of like uh, Barry Schwartz, who wrote the, the, he wrote the Paradox of Choice, that's very much from his, his work. And so as you do that, you eliminate something, it's gone forever. And then as you do that, each time you compare, you choose the better, eliminate the other until you get down to your final option. And so that's kind of the way of doing it. You trick yourself into feeling like you're getting the better and then you get rid of the other one so you don't think about it ever again. And that's how you drive to a, a overcoming FOBO in a major decision. So it's a lot of information I realize to tell you right now, but obviously it's in the book and in the TED Talk. So um, if you have questions, we can address them in the, the Q&A. Uh, that sounds perfect. And yeah, I, I do hope that folks look up the book, look up the TED Talk. And then you're also on patrickmcginnis.com, right? As far right. as your resources are channeled in there as well. W when, you, when you talk about these uh, different kinds of stakes in decision making, it sounds like the focus is thoughtful action and action focused orientation. Is that right? Yeah, because what's happening when we feel FOMO and FOBO. So the acronyms inside of those acronyms, hiding in plain sight, is the word fear. And mm -hmm. fear-based decision-making is based on emotion. And what happens when we, when, when our, and by the way, I did a, like a crazy amount of research for this book. I'd never done a research-based book before. My first one was sort of based on, you know, me. Life experience, so, is it? Right. And so, I mean, interviews, but like this one, I got deep into it because clinical psychologists have done a tremendous amount of research on FOMO. I, when I saw this, it was kind of incredibly validating and kind of shocking at the same time, how many journal articles have been done by, you know, sort of real clinical psychologists on this, on this topic, because it's got serious implications for our health and well-being, right? And so what I, I learned in this is that, you know, your emotional response is hijacking your intuition and your logic. And so what you need to do is pull back decision-making away from this brink of fear and bring it back into the world of facts, and when you do that, then you can better trust your intuition to help you to make those decisions. But you know, when we're feeling FOMO, we're just having an emotional response and therefore we're unable to make strong and, and solid decisions. Makes sense. And this is the different categorizations that folks in a variety of fields have for different levels of function and different morphology of the brain that we have, i.e. the reptilian versus mammalian versus human kind of decision-making. And you're talking about the fight or flight kind of response and the reptilian maybe part taking over and taking a hard hold on maybe some decisions that are extremely important, yet yet people are not able to see beyond beyond that fear, right? 
Yeah, I, I think there, there was a, uh, I just had uh, my podcast, this, this um, guy called Jay Shetty, who mm. some of you may know, and he's like everywhere right now. A guy is insane. Right. Um, but he wrote a book called Think Like a Monk. And he, the way he characterizes it, which I thought was, uh, was good. And it, I think this is, this is not just his, this is sort of a long mindset from the Buddhist tradition is the monk mind versus the monkey mind. The mm. monkey mind is all over the place. The monk mind is able to step back with equanimity and view things in a calm manner. And therefore, you know, it's like you're sort of floating above it and you can sort of assess things in a way that allows you to make much more sort of dispassionate decisions. That's interesting. And I, and I have heard in different branches of psychology where people are talking about moderating emotions by thinking through what is that emotion? I'm observing an emotion. I'm feeling this right now. Hence, because I recognize it, then perhaps I'm, I'm dealing with it more thoughtfully. It's a similar approach? Yeah, I mean, what's happening when you're feeling FOMO? So I, I um, found this guy who is amazing called Michael Rogan, who's mm -hmm. uh, got a PhD in sort of neurobiology, but also has been practicing Buddhist meditation for 40 years and teaches it. And so he, and he's also a startup, uh, a founder, entrepreneur. So he's kind of got like the trifecta in terms of the things that I was exploring um, in the book, um, because the book is very much kind of, it's very much oriented towards people who are of a business, it's a business book, you know, it's VCs and entrepreneurs and types like that. And so anyway, um, what he explains, which I think is really powerful, he sort of he sort of threads together the Eastern traditions with modern science and clinical psychology and the fact that when you're feeling these feelings of FOMO and FOBO, as I mentioned, they're based on perception. And so what's happening is you don't really know if something's so great, like it's all going on in here. And so therefore, the more time you spend in your head kind of going through the options and thinking about the options and trying to optimize, you are disconnecting yourself from reality. And so that's where the pathology begins is when your connection to reality becomes less and less sort of grounded. And that's why actually meditation is one way to combat FOMO because when you're, when you're, when you're practicing mindfulness or meditation, you are grounding yourself in the, in the reality of the world you're in. You're not spinning in your head. You're very much rooted. And that breaks that sort of that spinning that's going on in your head so that you can observe things with much more calm. That's, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. And when you talk about calm versus focus versus over obsessing about certain ideas, one of the um, chapters in your book that I was pleasantly surprised by, because it looks like you're talking about it ahead of some other folks that are starting to talk about it in a big way right now during the pandemic, we're overwhelmed with information. We may be over focused on things, over obsessed on things. And you have a chapter called focus on what matters and forget what doesn't. Can you talk a little bit about that and the importance of it in our age? Yeah. So as the inventor of the word FOMO, uh, you know, I, I am naturally predisposed to be all over the place and to be, and, and I, I, you know, I just love information. I love constantly to be in the flow of information. I think many of us do, right? And the reality is that, you know, I think back to when was the last time I was bored in life? It's like the day before I got my cell phone here, because when I got my cell phone, my smartphone, I got, I didn't get the first iPhone. I was, I got the second iPhone, but it's like from that moment on, it's sort of like every time you have a little bit of free time or you're, I can't even watch a TV show anymore. It's like, you're on your phone, you're on the third screen or second screen. So we spend so much of our time, whether we're in the line at the supermarket, whether we're on the phone with our friends, whether we're watching television, whether we're walking down the street, listening to a podcast, we are splitting our attention, right? And, and that is, by the way, like I do that. It's not that I'm some sort of perfect, you know, I, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that I have figured it all out because that would be a terrible lie. And I'm not gonna lie to you people. Uh, but what I would say is that I have tried to create some basic boundaries for myself. Mm. little things like not having the phone in the bedroom, um, you know, taking the apps off the front of my phone that are most difficult for me or taking them off the phone, just little things like that. Uh, there's a lot of sort of hacks and tricks that I put into the book and thinking deeply about, you know, how you're interacting with technology because yeah, FOMO existed before technology and technology isn't the only cause, but it's an accelerant that causes us to be very unfocused. And so there's a bunch of ways and on the pod, I've had a bunch of folks on that are experts in sort of like focused work and work from home. And I'm not a productivity expert. That's not, um, that's not where I want to 
play because a lot of those productivity um, experts are all about like a very rigid system that you must follow the rest of your mm. life, which mm. is just, that's just not who I am. I, I can't do it. But I do think that sort of having a, a mindful relationship and setting some, some boundaries and sort of like recognizing that it's kind of like nutrition, you got to sort of eat, have a healthy diet. All of those things help you to focus on what matters and eliminate what doesn't. That makes sense. Thank you. We have audience questions starting to come in. Rob Francis is asking, Patrick, you suggest that we should be basing our decision making on facts, which makes a ton of logical sense. Part of the issue for me is that I tend to reflect on a decision and conclude, I do not know what I do not know, which yeah. throws me back into the FOMO cycle. Any suggestions on where slash when to draw the line on fact gathering to make decisions? 80%? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, would it be, uh, Rob is asking, 80% solution, is an 80% solution okay? And what, what, other, what other guiding principles do you use? Yeah, I love that question. And, and it's, um, so a couple of things that, that I didn't mention earlier that might be helpful to you. Number one is when, whether you're dealing with FOMO or FOBO on the big things, not the little things, of course, because we're just going to outsource that stuff. Um, when we're dealing with the big things, number one, uh, I try to be very careful about defining the question. Like what am I, you know, sometimes when we're in a decision-making process, we haven't thought deeply enough about what the, what is, what is actually the question we're trying to answer. So I think first about the question, you know, for example, should we invest, should I invest in this company or not, right? Mm. The great, it's a very simple one. Um, the question isn't, but, but the question isn't, will my friend be mad at me if I don't invest in her startup, right? Which sometimes is going on in our head. That's not the question. The question is, should I invest or not? And then it's sort of like I set criteria, you know, and this as an investment, it'd be like, does this investment make sense? Do I have enough capital? Do I, is the timeline uh, sort of fit with my overall financial goals? Um, you know, do I understand who these people are? All this sort of stuff that, and, it, and then I do my diligence on those things. And part of, um, part of what's important to do here is really write these things down. I make decisions are like investments. And so I write an investment memo when it comes to the important decisions, not only to help me make sure that I, it's hard to lie to yourself on paper in the way you can in your head, but also that I have, so that I have a record of my thinking later on so I can go back and remember, okay, where was my head at? Where did I go right or wrong? Um, it's a great way to sort of just starting to build process, right? Now you get to the point where there are gonna be uncertain things, right? And so it's at this point that I, I, I encourage people, there is no, um, you cannot find all the information you need on Google or inside of your head. You really need to go out into the world and when you have questions you cannot answer, um, you need to talk to people as much as you can and, and surface as much information. Now, I don't say to canvas, obviously. I keep yourself sort of within five to 10 people and limit yourself into a band of a week or two. But you want to sort of make sure that you're gaining um, the, the value of going out to people. And I also encourage like cold calling people. Say you're thinking about investing in your friend's company and it's a store, go to the street and go to stores that are in the industry and talk to the owners, right? Just try to gain some insight, right? Now, that's, I think, probably something you're already doing. And in, in this crowd, people know how to do a diligence process, right? Then you get to the point where um, you may already know, yes, I want to do this. Or you may still be stuck. Um, that's the point where I, I encourage you to bring in, sort of show your work to other people. You've written it down. Show it to like three other people. Get their feedback. And at that point, if you are still stuck, okay, you're still stuck. That's the point where I say, go ahead and do it. Because you have done the work. The problem here isn't that you're basing your decision on perception. No, you've, you've eliminated as much of the perception as you can. Now you're stuck because every decision has risks and we get stuck because we're afraid of failing or making the wrong decision. But you have removed the FOMO. You are basing your, your decision as much as you can on facts. And now you must move forward because you have done the work that you need to do so feeling honest to yourself. And so I think that's the way to think about it. There's no sort of perfect percentage but, um, but if, I hope that's helpful in just sort of thinking about the dynamics that you need to go through. And bringing in other people to help you think through it, I think is very valuable because like a venture capital firm, like the partner of a VC firm doesn't just make the decision themselves. They have an investment committee and you can put together your own investment committee of people who can give you sensible guidance and advice and even push back on you. Thank you, that's very useful advice and specific examples, Patrick. And then we have another question coming in which, which asks, 
when making innovation choices where known trends are not available to make a fact-based decision, how does one tackle FOBO? For instance, when making design choices for which external feedback is not meaningful, how does one overcome FOBO? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think on that one, let's go back to the definition. I always go back to my definitions, that way I don't lead you astray. So FOBO is an anxiety uh, that is created by the fear that there's something better out there for you, combined by a desire to keep all your options open as long as possible. And one of the things that I would, that I would tell you about FOBO that's really sneaky and terrible is, and this is the part that like always gets people, is that when we feel FOBO, we assume that our decision set will only grow and not shrink, okay? It's like, well, I have all these great options. I'm just gonna keep looking, I'm gonna keep you know, fishing, looking for the bigger fish. And these fish will be over here and they'll be waiting for me, right? Fish die and decisions disappear. And the more that you delay, the more that you risk actually forfeiting some of the good things that you have in the present. And a great example, well, it's not a great example, it's a terrible example, um, is, uh, for example, um, uh, the pandemic. If people had made decisive, hard decisions early on, they wouldn't, you know, if, if you do the tripwire early enough and make everybody sort of take the pain, then you can sort of avoid a lot of the early, instead there's delay and not being decisive and like all of the like if you look at England, you know, so like the rules, nobody really gets it. And like, well, should I wear a mask or not? All this sort of stuff in the early days that like, had there been decisive, decisive action taken, mm -hmm. I think we would have seen much better results, right? But no, and so what happens is the more you delay, actually the early, you, the thing you could have done early is no longer available to you. And so number one, I would think carefully about, okay, like if we keep on delaying and delaying, and delaying, like our competitors are going to keep up with us. They're going to, they're going to find ways to respond to us. And we're going to sort of, um, we're going to lose this sort of advantage that we have as a mover. And the second is, is that I would think about um, how do you, um, how do you sort of test options to try to get some quick feedback? And then, and then, you know, it's sort of like the lean startup. That's, that's the thing that helps people as well, because um, obviously uh, the thing about FOBO that's messed up is it's based on perception you don't really know. And so obviously you want to run, get as much data as you can, but recognize that time is of the essence and then go through a structured process to pick that front runner and eliminate others and move forward. Because the big thing that you always want to keep in mind with FOBO is that FOBO feels good. FOBO feels good because you're not taking risk, right? You don't think, well, you are taking risk, but you don't perceive it. Um, you're, you're in this comfortable place where you haven't actually like taken any risk yet. Um, but the problem is you're not allowing yourself to move on to that next set of decisions, that next set of decisions. And innovators must make decisions to move forward to the next set and the next set and next set to move forward um, towards an eventual sort of product. And when you're doing that, you're staying at stage one. And so remembering that, um, that this isn't the only decision you'll ever make can be helpful in, in sort of getting you over the hump in terms of moving on to the second and the third and the fourth. That makes sense. That makes sense. Thank you. And we're getting some questions. And in some of your answers, you're talking about entrepreneurship, investing, questions about innovation and business. You authored the 10% Entrepreneur, uh, live, live Your Startup Dream Without Quitting Your Day Job. Can you talk a little bit about that book, its concept? Is it still relevant? How does it? Oh, great. Yes, yes. And uh, how, how does it relate to FOMO and FOBO uh, still? How, do, how is it relevant during the pandemic? Can you share a little bit more on that, on, that, on those concepts? Absolutely. So the 10% entrepreneur was my personal response to being um, absolutely destroyed during the 2008 financial crisis. So I worked at a, the private equity division of AIG Capital, AIG, AIG Capital Partners. When uh, AIG went bankrupt in 2008 and was nationalized, our business got, like just, it was terrible. My stock fell 97%. And I realized that I was not diversified. And that, you know, despite having the HBS MBA and all the work experience that I had, um, it didn't matter. I was extraordinarily exposed. And that caused me to start uh, to diversify myself by spending 10% of my time and investing at least 10% of my resources in side projects. And I invested in startups and I started things and I became an advisor to a bunch of things. And um, you know, invested in friends, real estate, little nothing, you know, not, again, this, I, I, I don't have like a, 
a family office. It's just, you know, a little bit of my capital. And in the process over a decade-ish, uh, eight years, I built up a portfolio of more than 20 things, some that have not gone anywhere, um, some that have done, you know, sort of like fine returns, you know, 10, 20% or whatever, uh, IRR, um, and some that have become unicorns. And a couple of my companies now are worth, um, you know, many, many times what, what I invested in. And I built this portfolio. Now, when the book came out in 2016, I talk about all the AIG stuff and how that caused me to realize that we must all diversify. And many people said to me, Patrick, you're obsessed with 2008. Um, you know, that's not going to happen again. That's a once in a lifetime thing. And I was like, I hope you're right. But if it happens again, I will be ready for it. Yes. And sure enough, 2020 is, I mean, it's like, it's a re really awful time for a lot of people. And when 2020, uh, the pandemic hit, a lot of what I do professionally got canceled, totally canceled, like speaking, my book came out in the middle of pandemic, it was disastrous. But my portfolio, which was diversified, has performed very well. Some of my companies have really benefited from the dislocations and the changes in digitalization. And so what I have seen is my strategy works. Um, and many other people I know who've enacted that kind of strategy based on the book have seen the same thing. And so what I would say is that uh, the, the basic premise of the 10% entrepreneur, which is that one job, you cannot rely on one job, you must diversify, you must build something that belongs to you that you can take anywhere, um, that has been only made more essential in this time. And in fact, the amount of people that have reached out to me in the last you know, six months, about 10%, I'm actually doing an audio course on 10%. Um, I think it's a really powerful tool, not just for folks like us, for everybody, um, it, you know, no matter where you are in the economy or what sort of your experience is, you can do these types of things. And so, um, so yeah, I feel very passionate about this idea as a way of fighting back against the crazy time that we live in. Very, very interesting. Thank you. It's very, very relevant still. And how about the valuations in the VC market as an example? In startups raising money at extreme valuations, continuing during the pandemic, uh, what do you think? In terms of FOMO, FOBO, uh, how, how, are you, how do you make sense of what, what is happening in the private markets? Oh, my goodness. It's so confusing, right? I, I, I have this whole um, chapter in the Fear of Missing Out book about FOMO and venture capital and Theranos. If you guys read um, uh, Bad That's Blood, by John Carey, right, who's my brother, teaches his son clarinet in New York City oh. here. Um, he talks about FOMO, right? right. And um, I've been calling the top of the VC market for like, <laughs> forever and like bitcoin and all that sort of stuff and right. I, I i don't quite like i did an episode of fomo sapiens with beth ferreira who's a partner at first mark here because in 2000 when the market when we had sort of uh, the dislocation like the market really crashed um and vc market was like carnage and i think what's happened these days is that the private markets have so much capital that folks are sort of just they're continuing to plow capital into this stuff. But in my own investing, I've been, I just don't understand the valuations. And so I'm not going to claim to, to know why they are. I get some of the stuff like around the Pelotons of the world and, and it's these sort of companies that are benefiting from these specific dislocations. But in Latin America, where I do a lot of investing, we're seeing companies that are completely overvalued. And so my personal investment philosophy has always been in my 10%. Get in super early with people that you think are really smart in industries that you understand and shoot, swing for the fences. Like I'm not, I had a friend who was like, do you want to invest with me in TikTok? The pre-money is $96 billion. And I was like, no, because like, I would rather make a hundred times my money on something risky than make three times my money on something that like I have no control over. And so my personal view is get in super early with things that you love that you believe in where you can add value and you can move the needle. And if you do that enough times, um, uh, you can actually sort of, you'll have uh, some, some interesting results. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. You mentioned Latin America. Uh, why, what are the reasons, what's happening there? Why are you spending time there? And how is it working out during the pandemic and doing this work remotely and not being able to travel as much as you used to? Yeah, I mean, so I've spent my whole career in Latin America. I started my career um, at J.P. Morgan Chase uh, in the first of all in the in Latin American investment banking. I was the least effective, least. I was a terrible investment banker, but I was there. Oh yeah, 
Then I did venture capital investing in the first wave of startups in Latin America, like Mercado Libre, which some of you may know. Um, I speak Spanish and Portuguese because uh, I lived in Argentina and Brazil when I was um, in college and, and working. And, and so I had um, I had always had an international career and uh, I was down in Peru speaking on my book, the first book, 10%, um, Emprendedor 10%, did well. And I, since I speak Spanish, I was able to do book tours and media. And so I was like constantly in the region. And one of my old friends from banking days and one of my uh, uh, guy at, who's 2003 at HBS, Martina Spiaga, were starting a fund based in Peru um, that we're now in market. And so um, we felt that it was, it made a lot of sense. Actually, three of the partners are in Lima, one's in, in Menlo Park, and I'm in New York, um, the right. investment committee members. And so in Latin America, you know, private equity has become a very local game since I, you know, the last 20 years because of the way that innovation spreads and, and, and the global nature of innovation and, and the fact that there's, um, there's lots happening in the States. There is a great argument to having folks here as well, because many of the companies we invest in are playing in global markets. So that's why I'm here. Um, and I would say, actually, like, I found it pretty easy to, for us to operate remotely during this period of time. And we've seen incredible opportunities. Just there has been like a 10 year shift forward in Latin America in terms of FinTech and e-commerce and all these other things um, that have made the region interesting, but obviously it's tricky. And, you know, last night we had the, the impeachment of the president of Peru, uh, if any of you saw that, and that's not helpful. So COVID has been really bad in Latin America. So a lot of challenges, but the fundamental sort of secular trends, I'm like Mike Pence, I have a fly. Um, the, the fundamental secular trends are super interesting and the level of entrepreneurship over the last 20 years, the amount of talent in the region is gone through the roof. So it's very exciting. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And in terms of what some of the VCs investors are doing right now during the pandemic, one of the big questions is, are people able to close remotely close over Zoom. In your case, you have some folks on the ground, but I'm not sure if they have work from home, if they have isolation restrictions like that. I'm not sure if they're seeing the companies, but certainly you are not. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you folks are doing it? Yeah, I mean, listen, a lot of people are closing their deals over Zoom. It hasn't been particularly controversial, and that's not just in the LATAM context, that's kind of everywhere, because mm -hmm. LATAM has been super locked down. Um, it's, it's one of the, you know, many of you, I don't have to tell you, it's been one of the most affected regions yes. in, in the world. But even in the US, um, I've seen it's loosening up now. And for example, um, a company I invested in called Ipsy just acquired its number one competitor, uh, BoxyCharm. And I know that like they were, they got together, right? And they were physically met up to do some of the work they needed to do. Um, but no, people are investing remotely. And I think this is where networks become so important. So our first investment that we did in our firm um, in Sakantai Exponential Fund in Peru was in a company where the founder um, is in my first book. And I didn't find the deal. Actually, I didn't even know we had sourced it. It came in an investment committee. And then I started, I had to like go into my files because I'm actually a shareholder from when I was an advisor to the business eight years ago. And so I had to recuse myself. But the fact that like we have this pre-existing relationship, it made it really easy for me to sort of tell my partners hey, like this is somebody I've worked with for a long time. You know, we can feel comfortable with him um, as a person. And so I think that's helpful. But even before the pandemic, I've invested in companies where uh, the founder raised capital from all over the world on Skypes. The problem with that though, I think in the old model is like, you do want to know the people you're raising capital from, because if you ever want to go back to them for more capital, unless you have amazing performance, um, you know, you're going to have a harder time. Whereas if you know the people, I think they're more willing to work with you uh, if the company isn't as scaling as quickly as you might have promised. Fantastic. Thank, thanks for sharing that on the power of relationships, snow, snowballing knowledge, and of course, being, being in the game for a longer period of time with, with preserving your reputation and uh, nurturing your success and, and how people perceive you in the market pays off, right? Especially during a crisis, during during a pandemic. Yeah. And then there, there's some questions coming in regarding FOBO. One is, have you looked into FOBO by age? I'm in awe of my 13 year old son who launched his own podcast in just a few weeks this past summer. He chose a topic, name, hosting, etc., without second guessing his choices. 
I would have been researching each option for months, says Deborah Glasser. So have you looked into FOBO by age and how different different folks of different age groups take action, uh, respond to fear, et cetera? I have. And I, first of all, it's really impressive. And it's so funny because um, I am amazed by um, sort of how entrepreneurial many of our sort of younger kids are, right? I, I have uh, the amount of kids I know who have launched podcasts and they're like pretty good too. And that's because of course the barrier to entries are lower in these things, but I love hearing stories like that. Um, I actually have this chart in the book, which is about FOBO over the life of a person. And as you see, it sort of goes up because what happens is um, when we're younger, you know, in order to have FOBO, you have to operate within a choice rich environment. And when you're a kid, uh, you may have choices. Yeah, it's not you have no choices, but like you really don't have a lot of agency over what you do in life and you're not overwhelmed with choice. And so therefore, you know, you sort of, um, life's a bit simpler and you've lived less and you have less data coming into your head. And you have less exposure to all of the information that can overwhelm us, right? And cause uh, analysis paralysis. What happens is over time, as we gain more options in life, as we have more power and wealth, our set of options expands dramatically. And that's where you see the shoot up in FOBO. That's where the risk is. And then as you notice, it goes down towards the end. Now, why is that? Because you get closer to the end of your life, you start to have a conversation with yourself. It's like, you know what? Like time is of the essence. Like I can't wait five years to make this decision because you know, I've got my health, I've got my you know, financial ability to do things. I gotta move because I don't know how long I'm gonna have this ability to do the things I wanna do. How long I'm gonna have the agency before you know, I'm being taken care of by somebody. It's depressing, but it's true. And so I think that's where you see the FOBO go down. Now during the pandemic, mm. I also think like your choice rich world was choice with like this. It's like, I'm not going anywhere. I have, you know, the, the, it became more about like Netflix, right? That's where the FOBO happened. It wasn't about like, where am I going on holiday? Because there was one choice, the other room. And so it's been really interesting to watch the phenomenon over the past, whatever, eight months. That's, that's fantastic. And that's very interesting and, and very true for sure. Uh, in terms of some of the other questions coming in, uh, FOBO is rooted more into the lack of confidence in the idea, i.e. cognitive, or fear of failure, i.e. emotional, or both. Is there science that tells one way over the other? And is the response strategy the same either way or is it different, whether it's a cognitive or an emotional response, Patrick? So what I found in, um, in, our, in my research is what, what, and this is a lot of the, um, if you, uh, some really good research that was done over the years by Barry Schwartz, who wrote, wrote if you've read The Paradox of Choice, which very much is kindred spirits of FOBO, Interestingly, he wrote that book in 2004 before we had social media, which is crazy, um, which is why I was like so fascinated to read his work. And what we see with FOBO, there's these famous studies that have been done where uh, if you do a bunch more research, you actually end up making a better decision, but you're less happy because you've expended so much energy that your chance of feeling regret at the road you didn't take is much higher. You've explored it so deeply that you choose this one, but you're very in touch with what you're foregoing. And so that is really what's happening when you're feeling FOBO. It's this idea of not being willing to mourn the option that you could not choose in order to choose just one thing. And so that's why the process of overcoming FOBO, which is eliminating something and then not going back to it, that's the critical part because we find, we, we, we run into the problem where we're trying to make a decision and instead of eliminating one thing permanently, we keep going back to the same set of options and back and we get stuck in this negative feedback loop. And so I don't know if that's emotional or cognitive actually, I, I, but that is the process. And so recognizing that, it's kind of like, I mean, I give this example in the book and it's, it sounds a little silly, but if you've ever done it, you'll get me. It's Marie Kondo. You know, I, um, if you ever moved or if you ever like clean up your house, we, we invest all this value into stuff that we barely even use. Like I have all this clothing that I never wear. I haven't worn it in years, but I keep it because I, I don't know. I just had this weird connection to it. And so when you sort of are appreciative of the options you have, but then let them go and move on to the ones that you actually want to choose. When you recognize that you're, that you're, um, that you are privileged to have such options, but then recognize that they are keeping you 
from moving forward to the next phase of your life. When you do that and you let them go, you are free from all of these emotions. Thank you, that's, that's very interesting. And speaking of uh, moving on, continuing, life goes on, you've talked about investing, uh, Fear of Missing Out came out and you mentioned that there'll be an audio book that you'll be releasing and forward, forward motion there. There's forward motion with respect to FOMO Sapiens, your podcast that I understand it's entered your fifth, already fifth season. And you have some folks, like you mentioned, Jay Shetty. You talk a little bit about the podcast and Deborah talked about create, uh, her son creating one. What did it take to create one? How has it been getting it to season five? And what will people see in this, this fifth season? Yeah, I mean, it's a, so I just got a pitch from some author. Uh, I get a lot of pitches these days, which is really cool. I feel thankful, um, feel the FOBO about choosing which ones to do, but it was like some new book called like, everybody's got a podcast, but you. Um, and uh, there are a lot of podcasts. I mean, you can look at the industry I think we're still early days, but when I started mine, a lot of people had told me, well, you should start a podcast. And I was like, it's a lot of work. And so if I'm gonna do this, I have to have three um, sort of things, conditions, precedent. Number one, I need to know that it can be a good, um, good quality product. Number two, I need distribution. And number three, I need sort of like to really commit myself to doing this. Cause it's not, you can't just do 10 episodes, right? You gotta like stick with it. It's all about the cadence. And so I, I started it because I was approached by Advertising Week who wanted to start podcasting. And they said, we will produce the show and um, it's going to be great quality and we'll distribute you and all that sort of stuff. And I love, I really appreciate they put me in business, but the quality was not what we needed. Um, and also when we did video, which is really hard to do at a high quality. And also they're, they just weren't sort of prepared to distribute at the level that we needed. And so, but I got some good traction and I had some great guests. And then um, Nitin Noria at HBS heard about it and invited me to meet the people at HBR. And I went and joined HBR and they presented me as part of their podcast network. And I did that for three seasons. And that was great because with the HBR kind of imprimatur, we were able to get like Andrew Yang and founders of companies from like Tom's to, you know, Zola to you name it. And so really amazing guests and um, great distribution. And we built up a really big audience. And so that was fantastic. But um, after a couple of years, I realized, and this was like kind of a, I don't know, interesting phenomenon. I realized that it was time to go independent, but I felt kind of afraid because it felt almost like graduating from Harvard again and like leaving the secure con you know, of nest of yes. the, 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 you know, the comforts of the Harvard world. But I decided that it was time to do that. And so I, I relaunched the show about a, a two weeks ago. Um, independent and we are just like building now it's been fantastic because um, you know it's now able to sort of build it to different places and have more flexibility and while I learned so much and I'm super thankful to HBR you know I think it's it's amazing to be able to sort of control your own destiny and our guests so far this season we've got Jay Shetty who we did double episode with him which was incredible uh, and Gretchen, Gretchen Rubin, Rubin I think Gretchen Rubin's yeah. coming on I'm um, gonna have David Allen who wrote Getting Things Done that okay. seminal book about productivity um, the founders of Floyd. I've got Kara Golden, the founder of Hint Water, who just came out with a best-selling book. Um, and others as well. I'm trying to think. I'm like interviewing. Every day I'm doing an interview. Um, but it's been, it's been awesome. And so the show is about how entrepreneurial thinkers um, make decisions no matter what life throws at them and how they actually choose what's important. And so it's been an awesome way to look at great stories from a diverse set of people. And um, it's a business podcast, but obviously it's also about decision-making. And so um, definitely check it out, Spotify, iTunes, wherever else, FOMOSapiens.com and um, subscribe. That's like, if you enjoyed today, if you wanna do one thing for me, that would be super helpful, subscribe because that drives everything with podcasts. And um, if you like the show, sorry, it's turned into a commercial. I didn't mean to do that, but. All good. It's metrics, metrics, driven on the metrics. People should know where to get more more good content. And in terms of the learnings that you get out of running a podcast, so obviously you're interviewed a lot, you've written, you've spoken, uh, and then now you interview people. What are some of the learnings people can take from that as they're having so many Zoom conversations? Maybe they're interviewing people. Maybe they're performing on, on camera. Any, any advice for folks? Yeah, well, number one, this is not, you didn't ask this question, but I will tell you, 
people there are haters out there and it's oh. you have to sort of like not engage because you'll have a you know hundreds of positive reviews and then that one person who's like this show has no point and it's easy to just go and focus on that right and you know i'd love to say that i'm immune but it just it's frustrating i'd say a couple of things in terms of um presenting and, and just doing living in our zoom world is number one um you know, invest a little bit. I don't have my whole setup today for sound, but I built a podcast studio in my apartment over there mm. with, you know, lighting and really good mics. And it's very cheap. Like the cost of the bar the cost of setting yourself up in a, in a basic podcasting setup is less than a thousand dollars to get extremely high quality. You can get studio level, level quality for $750 or less. And if you want to know more about that, just drop me a line. I'm, I'll tell you. Um, that's number one. Number two is it's it's shockingly easy to get amazing people to come on your podcast because people are looking for ways, especially writers. Um, they have no way to assess whether your show is big or not. And so like, even in my early days when it was still like very incipient, I could get reasonably good people to come on the show. Uh, number three is I would say the, the things that I've had to struggle with, the, the two challenges for me or three are number one, getting the focus of the show right. It's really hard to know, to make a show with a big enough concept that it, you can kind of do anything, but narrow enough that you know what to focus on. Um, number two is uh, um, uh, monetization is always tricky. Just figuring out how to best create a product that people want to want to stick with, and then how to monetize that. Because there's a million and one podcasts out there that make no money, and that's great if it's a hobby. But if it's part of your business, then you need to think about that to make it sustainable. And number three is you can't do it alone. So like I have a team of people who does really helps me with like, you know, imagery and like all the design and the website. I, it's really, it's, and you can do that. My team is, is all over the world, mostly in Latin America. And so there's great ways to get amazing talent all over the place. But I would say um, you can become overwhelmed really quickly if you try to do everything. Because podcasts, it's like a treadmill. Once you're on it, it just keeps going. And I enjoy it. But that's the other thing. You may not enjoy being the post host of a podcast. So try it out first and see if you like it, you know, with friends and family before you sort of engage with it full time. That's fair. That's fair. Well, I certainly am looking forward to more episodes and more sessions of FOMA Sapiens. Uh, fear of missing out the book is here. And Patrick, thank you so much for joining us for this insightful conversation. Always a pleasure to see you. Thanks on behalf of the HBS Club of Toronto. Thank you so much, Boris. And I'm sorry, obviously couldn't be there in person, but um, I thank everybody for the time and also for asking such great questions. Um, there were some that I've not had before. So, um, so uh, I hope that, um, you know, things are changing in the world in a positive way and that within some period of time, we'll get to meet up in person in Canada um, in a much more chilled out global environment. That will be fantastic. Wishing for that, hoping for that, looking forward to it. Have a great rest of your afternoon, Patrick and everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.